Thank you very much, Dr. Angelakos, President Whitaker, Dean Denise Devlin Lee, the whole panel of Humber, esteemed Humber staff on the platform. I'd like to thank the School of Applied Technology and, of course, the Civil Engineering Department from which I graduated and its professors. I'm thrilled and humbled to be here today to receive this honorary degree, and I'm delighted to be back at Humber with you here today. I have a great amount of respect for Humber, and I'm grateful that this degree connects me even closer to this wonderful college. First, I give my sincere congratulations to you, the graduates. Today, you're celebrating the culmination of years of hard work. This is your day. You've earned it. Enjoy it. It's a privilege and honor for me to share my thoughts with you today as the recipient of the honorary degree. I want to briefly share with you some highlights of the journey that brought me here. I, like many of you, am the first person in my family to receive the gift of a post-secondary education. I grew up with a love for building things, understanding how things work. From a young age, I excelled in school, and in particular in the sciences, and in particular physics. Despite doing very well in all my classes, Throughout my school years, there was one problem. I absolutely hated math. Now, I hear some people gasping, and I, I know it's a concern when you hear an engineer hating math, but I do assure you all the bridges I've designed are still standing. So. <laughs> Although I, I always did well in math, the topic itself didn't interest me. I found it to be simply a lot of useless theories uh, with no practicality, or at least I thought so at the time. But as I began contemplating various career paths in high school, and trying to find something that would allow me to continue on with my interest in physics, but more importantly, continue on with my interest in physics and combine that with my interest in building things. At about the same time in physics class, we were starting to study forces and their effects on objects. And I began to question, how, how do things and these forces, how are they in particular, these forces of nature, how can they be withstood by man-made objects? Especially at the time, I had just seen a photo of the Golden Gate Bridge in a physics textbook. I didn't understand how such slender and graceful structures, spanning such large distances, were able to withstand such extreme forces, such as earthquakes, collisions, wind. Yet, from a distance, they appeared so slender and vulnerable to those exact same forces. Thus started my interest in bridges and the field of bridge engineering. There was only one problem, math. If I was going to design bridges, I'd need to enroll in an engineering program which meant I would have to take many more math courses throughout the course of my studies. At the same time as I was struggling with the notion of pursuing a career heavily founded in math, even more importantly, I was struggling with the reality of paying for it. Coming from a lower income immigrant single parent family, post-secondary education was not in the picture for me. Humber, however, changed that. The tuition costs at Humber, and especially in comparison to universities, allowed me to pursue my passion. The professors took an interest in students and spent time getting to know them. Needless to say, the first topic of conversation for me with the professors was math and how much I'd have to do of it. One professor in particular, Lionel Wolpert, helped me understand how to make, take my shortcomings, or at least perceived shortcomings, and turn them into strengths by explaining the reality of the design industry to me, namely that math is simply a tool that we use to achieve a desired final result. In other words, I didn't know, I didn't need ha to have to memorize all the mathematical formula or memorize all those derivations. I did, know, have, I did have to learn how to apply those in order to come up with a final uh, desired result, which was to design complex structures such as bridges. That was my first opportunity to experience the benefit of having a mentor. He and other professors at Humber were instrumental in continuing my studies after graduation. In fact, when I was contemplating continuing on to the University of Toronto, and was apprehensive about how I would measure up in that program. He encouraged me by saying, an A student at Humber is an A student anywhere. <laughs> that mentor and close friends made while at Humber, both of which are here today, proved invaluable throughout my career. They've supported me. We've met to discuss professional experiences, have provided career advice, and have even provided guidance during difficult times and difficult decisions throughout my career. 
but they've also been the voice of reason when I found myself presented with opportunities for advancement very early on, very early on in my career, before I even developed the necessary technical skills, let alone management skills. No doubt it's never easy to hear, Andy, do you really think you're ready for that? From people that you respect. Especially when you're young and you, th and you think you've learned all that you're going to learn and you're ready for any challenge ahead of you, and especially when those challenges involve higher salaries. That, however, is when you know you've chosen the right mentors and friends. When they not only support you, but they help shore up your shortcomings to prepare you for advancement in the future. I've also learned, however, and more importantly, that there's no substitute for hard work and the absolute need to have a strong technical background and foundation on which to build your career. This is just as important now as ever before, maybe even more so especially as times change and we begin to see less focus and less importance being placed on technical competence and more on business skills, especially at a time when people want to springboard into management positions without the proper background and experience. Two things have always separated the true, well-respected leaders in the industry from the rest. A strong support network of mentors and friends and people you can trust around them, and solid technical competence both of which have proven extremely valuable even throughout my own career. One such example is the first international project I worked on uh, called Palm Island in Dubai. You may have seen it uh, on the Learning Channel. It's essentially a man-made island in the shape of a palm tree off the coast of Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Being my first international project with a cost in the billions of dollars and a design team of the top engineers, architects, interior designers, and contractors from around the world, Schedules were tight, and there was no time to second-guess yourself or redo work. Near the end of the project, however, I found myself in a very difficult situation. One of the bridges I designed was being constructed, and the senior engineer overlooking the work in Dubai, who had over 30 years' experience and was an internationally known engineer, decided to change the design during construction without telling anyone. Now, because Palm Island is a man-made island, the bridge in question was supported on each end by three reinforced concrete columns called piles or caissons. And those in turn were founded on the seabed 20 meters down. So if you can picture it, on each end the bridge was sitting on basically stilts, which made their way all the way down to the seabed. What that senior engineer decided to do was to eliminate that middle of the three piles from each end of the bridge in order to save money. Trying to convince the staff in Dubai that that middle pile was needed for the safe construction and operation of the bridge, the, rece the response I received was simply, he has over 30 years experience and is one of the most well-known engineers in the world. He knows better than you. I didn't second guess the design, but I did have to set about ensuring that what I was saying was truly correct, as an issue of re reputation was on the line for both the engineer and myself. I can tell you there were very many sleepless nights number crunching, checking, and rechecking calculations to ensure what we were saying was correct. Once we assured ourselves that we were correct and we discussed the situation with mentors and those around us we trusted, the issue was presented to management. Of course, they were skeptical. How can a young engineer and a young designer be correct when a well-known internationally recognized engineer with decades of experience, how could he have made such a simple error? After reviewing the calculations, though, they quickly realized the error. What that senior engineer forgot, or what that senior engineer with decades of experience neglected to account was a critical stage during construction, when concrete hasn't fully reached its full strength, and therefore doesn't have its uh, full capacity to take load. His decision, unfortunately, was made without making any calculations or any supporting documents, and that unfortunately would have caused the bridge foundations to snap in half at its weakest point in the middle where he had removed that support. In retrospect, in retrospect, it makes us think you spend your whole life building your career and your reputation, but you can lose it in a minute. How important then it is really to learn from our mistakes and from the mistakes of others. And we all make them, it's human. I know I have learned from the multiple mistakes I've made throughout my career. We're reminded of the words of Henry Petrosky, which are applicable to all of us here today, no matter what field we're graduating with. He said, engineers, and feel free to put your specialization there, are not superhuman. They make mistakes in their assumptions, in their calculations, in their conclusions. That they make mistakes is forgivable. That they catch them is imperative. After all, 
it's true what they say, design really is nothing more than the art of modeling materials we don't wholly understand into shapes we can't precisely analyze as to withstand forces we cannot properly assess in such a way that the public has no reason to suspect the extent of our ignorance. Unfortunately true. Unfortunately, construction of the foundations of the bridge were almost complete, so we had to come up and design an underpinning scheme to support that bridge during construction. It would have been very easy to shy away from the situation when my concerns were dismissed by this internationally recognized expert. None of it, however, would have been possible without solid technical background and belief in technical abilities that I had uh, built up throughout the years. I would not have been able to catch the error, have the credibility to convince management of the error, and be trusted to design a solution had I not had that technical competence. The first management position that followed shortly thereafter in my career would also not have been possible had I not proven the technical expertise first. But technical skills are not something that you learn and push aside later on in your career as you advance and move into management. Maintaining technical expertise has allowed me to continue to push beyond the traditional framework of typical design by developing and introducing into projects new and innovative concepts and structural systems. Despite the reluctance from industry to accept these ideas, and you'll find this mentality still exists, unfortunately, those new concepts and systems that were considered risky when they were being proposed were later acknowledged with awards and were implement when implemented and their performance was proven. And some have even gone on to become the new standard way of doing things now. We must continue to press forward with innovation. Now more than ever, while undergoing budget constraints in all industries and future uncertainties, it will be up to you to lead the way in innovation. This, of course, comes with strong technical skills, belief in your abilities, and proper mentorship. You have these requirements. After all, you're graduates of Humber. The same trusted support network I made at Humber and the solid technical foundation that I established at Humber and continue to build upon throughout my career have continued to help me even today in my role as an executive. Despite the ever-changing applied technology industry, there are some things that have never changed and some things that will always have value to time indefinite. Those are technical expertise, credibility, values, and ethics. Never allow any of these to be compromised throughout your career. Take pride in being a graduate of Humber, knowing you've been well prepared for what's ahead in your careers. But also, never forget to give back with the most valuable thing you have your time. Looking into the future, perhaps when you're twice your current age and you've excelled in your, current, in your chosen professions, you may receive a call or an email from a professor at Humber asking you to come back and do a presentation or asking you to volunteer and join a committee in the hopes that you'll be able to share some of your wisdom back with Humber and maybe even help students get some jobs. Share your knowledge. After all, those students you'll be helping will be Humber graduates, just like us. When I'm asked why I give of my time and volunteer at Humber, I simply respond, because it's Humber. To all of you, I wish you a full life and successful careers with many contributions. And I thank you for allowing me to be part of your special day. <laughs>